Well, what's up, Resonate? Good to see you guys. We are in this fourth part of this series called A Brand New Me. And, and in this, as we begin to think through even that, that content, this idea of trying really hard to actually just kind of eke out a little bit of something that we're after. And this, this idea is something that we're trying to press into and just say, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something more to life than trying really hard to barely get by, to struggle and, and really work at it. And as we press into this content, um, man, I'm incredibly excited to really figure out what does this look like and how do we begin to press into something? Did you see what it says? This incredible picture of the most generous and life-giving people in the world. We started this whole series talking about this idea that we should ask the really hard question of Christianity, and that is, does it work? Not will it work, but does it work right now? Does, does it actually transform our lives? And is it actually something that is revolutionizing our life? And as we press into this, we started this content um, and preparing this content almost a year ago. And God has brought us into a place uh, where I think it really calls out of us. Are we living up to the standards that God has called us to live to? Are we, are we becoming the people that he's called us to be? And this is particularly a, a pertinent question as we begin to walk through some of the things that we've walked through last semester, as we begin to see that God is, is calling our church to, to, to really be at the forefront of this movement to plant college churches across uh, the Northwest and, and really asking, what will it require of us? What does this look like? And, and, and asking ourselves, are we living into the reality that God's called us into live? Are, are we really experiencing the joy and the satisfaction? And, and are we living in power? And, and, and are we living in the kind of love that, that, that he's called us to live? And this has really pressed us into this. And I think that um, as, as we have kind of walked in faith on this, man, God has is, is ordained this content to land in our hearts for this, and I'm extremely excited about uh, what we get to get into tonight. We start off, um, I, I want to back up just a little bit and, and help us to understand this process um, by which we've gotten here in this, in this fourth part of this series. Um, it started with this core idea that it's not just this, that Jesus gave his life for us to affect us, to affect what happens when we die, but Jesus gave his life to us to affect what happens as we live. I, I want to say that again, that Jesus gave his life to us to affect what happens as we live. I want you and I to repeat that uh, together, that last statement uh, up on the screen. One, two, three. Jesus gave his life to us to affect what happens as we live. Now, I want you to go to a happy place. I want you to get to like this, this moment of, of, of pure joy, and you can kind of link those together so you don't ever forget that thought. Because here's what happens, I think, that when we, for, for those of you who are followers of Christ, we come into this relationship with God, and it's based upon the, the, the who of Jesus. And, and that who of Jesus, we're drawn to this, and we're, we want to establish a relationship with God. But oftentimes, what happens is we begin to, to kind of come into this reality that this, this relationship with God is something that, that really is culminated when we die. That, that, this, that the effect of this whole decision to follow Christ has its most greatest effect for us on the other side of this life. And so we live all our life and ultimately what happens is we subtly fall into this idea that, that this Jesus is for us when we die but he's not given himself to us so that we begin to actually live a compelling, a remarkable life. And here's my... Here's the reality. That, that very early in the, in the period of, of, of Jesus uh, establishing his kingdom on earth and then going back to heaven, what happened is that immediately people began to go back into this religious, works-based way of thinking. And what it began to do is sap the power from what it means for us to understand who Jesus is and to walk in joy and satisfaction with Jesus. And so Paul comes in and helps us say, I need to clarify some stuff. I want us to understand what is going on here and for you to live a remarkable and powerful life as God intended you, not just in the sweet by and by, but in the now, in the here and now. And, and this is 
but kind of basic Christianity, but I think in the life of our church, even for right now, I, I want us to get into this because I think that oftentimes what we've done is kind of slip back into a religious workspace relationship with God. And, and it's just this thing that kind of eats away at us and it kind of slows down the progress of the gospel in our hearts and in our cities and on our campuses. And, and I want us to say, hey, that's, that's, that's not going to be what defines us that God has called us to so much more. And so what happens is this, when we begin to get into a workspace understanding, it, it looks like this, kind of you ought to, you don't, you're shamed, you're forgiven, repeat. You ought to, but you don't, so you feel shame, but you have Jesus, so you feel forgiven, but the problem is, is that Jesus is a distant reality in your life, not a present reality in your life. It's not actually changing your life. And so there's this cycle of repeating stuff over and over and over. And what happens is this, is that we don't live these remarkable lives, these power-filled lives, these transformed lives. We live hope-filled lives. We live kind of pointed towards the future kind of lives. But but the thing is, is that there's so much more right in front of us. And I want you to live a life that the people around you begin to say, I want your life. That there's something that you have that I want. And the closer I get to you, I realize that there's a distance between my life and your life. And this is the life that when we see ourselves being in Christ, when we see ourselves being people that are, that are completely new creations, not just inspired creations. The Bible says that I've come that you might be a new person, to have a new heart, and that that would be something that radically transforms this whole thing. So we started off in the very beginning in understanding that, that this is us, not literally us, but this is as close as I could find to something that I could identify and looks like me. So this is Woody from Toy Story, right? And so we begin to understand that in our nature, from the very beginning, we are in Adam, right? And so this is us. We are not... We are not good people that sometimes do bad things, but our very nature is sinful. So we are by nature people who do bad things and sometimes do good things. But what happens is that Jesus comes and he rescues us from our sinful nature and he puts us through his death. He transfers that to us. So it is as if we died to that old self, to that old way of living, and now we have this available life in Christ. But what do you do with that? How do you begin to live into that? See, most people think, okay, that's great for what happens after I die, but actually, how does that live? And the world looks at us and says, I'm not sure if your life looks a whole lot different than mine, which means we missed Christianity, which means we don't fully understand what this is all about. And so we come back to this, and we begin to say, what does it look like to, for us to violently push against religion and begin to understand what it means to live in the grace of Jesus Christ? and have that transform our lives so that we live remarkable lives, so that we live joy-filled lives. This is just something that creeps in, and we need to point at it and identify it. And so we need to talk about some things that are in our lives, those loops that we kind of get stuck in, that stuff that we feel like we just kind of go back to over and over. we gotta, we got to talk about these places where it feels like we're just kind of stuck. We're just kind of in a, in a holding pattern. We're trying to manage our sin, but we just kind of keep going back for it. And we say, I keep, if I'm really honest, I'm not being transformed by this. I'm just trying to manage this. And this is pervasive. And, and I want us to have those expectations of Christianity that are so much higher than I think what we're experiencing right now. That actually God can transform this. So we need to talk about your porn problem. We need to talk about your body image issues. We need to talk about your greediness. We need to talk about your obsession with your social media image. We need to talk about um, your apathy to get into the word. You're, you're, you're white knuckling yourself to try to love Jesus more. We need to talk about whatever it is that's been your thing for a while and be able to point this out and be able to say, hey, this is not what we've been called to do. That we should not, as a group of people, allow ourselves to continually be people that are not transformed. And what I believe is that there's a lot of bondage in this, that there's people who are stuck in some places. And I believe if we begin to understand this, then, 
then we become people whose lives are so attractive that, that, that we lift up Jesus and Jesus draws people to us and by nature draws people into this church and we begin to see some significant things and it all starts back with how you see yourself and how you understand this. So let's go. I, when we begin to see this, Paul begins to help us to understand uh, maybe a verse that we can all really relate to. And we're going to start here in Romans 7. Romans 7 verse 15, I, I think, is a, a beautiful thing. If you are a Christian, if you are a God person, if you're not, you probably can agree with some of the sentiments that, that we find in Romans 15. Here's what it says. It says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it's sin living in me. Right? So he's beginning to, to kind of help us describe that loop. Hey, I'm trying to do this. And as I'm trying to do this, I, you know, I ought to, but I don't, and I can't figure out what's wrong. And, and, and whatever it is that you might think, hey, this is, this is my theory on why I don't do what I ought to do, or, or I think I should do, or I want to do. There's all kinds of those things that we begin to say, okay, this is what this uh, looks like. We, we're trying to identify some of these things. But Paul helps us to understand this is something that's going on in you, that you begin to understand that, that for the believer, there's, there's some things that has happened that, that sin, we talked about... We talked about Mr. Sin here, um, and, and Mr. Sin, when we begin to understand that it is not you, when you came and you accepted Christ, you are a new creation. You are in Christ. But that doesn't mean that Mr. Sin goes away. That in your body, there's still an entity of sin that is in there. And what sin does is it leverages the law. It leverages the, the things of, of God to be able to say, this is uh, this is where you're failing. This is where you should be ashamed of yourself. This is where you're not measuring up. There's this condemnation and it heaps it on you. And, and oftentimes, here's what happens. We begin to believe this. We begin to get so in this loop. And they said, man, if, it's, if this is what it means to be a Christian, well, I am, I, I'm horrible at being a Christian and I should just give up on being a Christian. We kind of press into this. And there's so many people that I've seen say, okay, if, if I ought to and I don't and I feel shame and I just keep going through this loop, I'm terrible as a Christian. I'm going to stop being a Christian. And what happens is they started this thing with a relationship and they ended up with a religion. And it affects so many of us that we begin to understand that, 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 that what sin does. And, and this is the, a brilliant thing because we have to understand this is not us. Sin is an entity. It is not us. And so when we call it out, we say this is sin in us, leveraging these commands to be able to, 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 to reveal to us, not that we need Christ, but we need to do more, that we need to try harder. That this is what happens. That Jesus says that I've come that you might live, not in bondage, but I've come that you might live a life that is an abundant life. And I want you to get that. I want you to believe Jesus' words. I want you to have the standard that if you don't think I'm living this abundant life, then you're missing something. Then there's something here that you kind of slipped back into a religious mindset. So when this happens, when we begin to understand that there is this, there is this false power that has come over you. There's this, there's this movie, I think it's back in the 70s, um, called Support Your Local Sheriff. And I'm almost 100% sure that none of you have seen this movie, right? In this movie, uh, a, a guy uh, is played by James Garner. And he's a, like this gunslinger, right? This really talented gunslinger. And uh, that's what he is. And so he becomes somehow a sheriff of this town. It's on the Wild West, out in the frontier. And they have created a jail, but it is out on the Wild West, and they don't have the ability to create bars. So they have built a jail, but it does not have a door. Now, this is obviously an issue because he finds a guy who he locks up, and this vigilante, this, uh, this outlaw, he, he, he arrests him, and he puts him into this jail without a door. Now, he understood that this was a problem when he took the job of being sheriff of this town. And so he came up with a solution, and his solution was this, that he took, and where that doorway was, he took a piece of chalk and drew a line where that door should be. And then he took red paint, and he sprinkled red paint right around that area where that chalk line was. So then he goes out, and he rests 
the outlaw, the vigilante. He takes this guy who has evaded the law, who has thumbed his nose at, uh, at any kind of organized peacekeeping, and he brings him into this cell. And he says, there's no door on this cell, but there's the line, and you cannot leave this cell. And then he points to the red on the ground and says, that's what happened to the last guy who left this cell. <laughs> we know that nothing happened to the last guy because this was the first guy. But he didn't know that, right? That chalk line was an invisible barrier that says you cannot leave. There's a fear that is instilled with you to say that you cannot get out of this cell. So he goes on about his business, right? He leaves. Um, there's nothing. There's no one in this entire uh, jail. There's, there's no one in this. And yet the prisoner, the vigilante, the outlaw stays locked in that cell without a door on his own accord. And no one can fathom how he stayed and how he could get this vigilante, this guy who's, who's evaded the law to have this confining slave you know, prisoner to this with just a piece of chalk, right? This is this crazy idea. But I would say for you and I, Oftentimes we are living these lives and we are owned by the sin over and over and over because not that the, it has power, there's no power, but somehow we believe that this is just what we should be doing. We believe that we should white knuckle our way into this. We believe that we could, should try to make this happen for ourselves. We believe that somehow we, could, we can just accomplish this on our own and it is powerless. It's a chalk line on the floor. You're free to live the life that God has called you to and yet we stay in the cells because somehow sin has said you can't do it sin has said this this is not going to be something that is actually true of you 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 haven't lived a life that deserves the grace that you've been afforded and so here's what happens so he goes on and says this verse 18 he says, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature, right? So in this, this is, this is not where this dwells, right? For I have the desire to do what is good, he says, but I cannot carry it out. And I love this because Paul's helping us clarify what religion does to us. It never allows us to fully succeed, it never allows us to fully succeed in this. So oftentimes we're trying to do this, but I promise you, if you understand this view of Christianity, if you, if you understand this view of Christ, you are always going to end up disappointed, always going to say, I didn't measure up, and you're going to live in shame, and many of you are going to give up. You cannot carry it out. This is the tractor, right? This is people pushing on the tractor. This is, they said, oh, we have this tractor, so let's push it, right? And so you're trying really hard and getting very little results out of your life. Cannot carry it out. He goes on, verse 19. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. And now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's sin that's living in me. And then he goes on to the next thing. He says, what a wretched man I am. This is this crazy moment. So he's saying, here's the struggle that's in me that, that I want to do this good, but I don't seem like I can do this good. Like th there's this tension in me. There's this struggle. It feels like there is this power that is owning me. There, there, there's this temp temptation. And in this, this is what is so stinking, uh, just, just crazy for us to be able to fully understand. Here is Paul. He is writing some of the most important lines in one of the most important books of the most important book of all time. And in this, as he's in this moment, it's got to be a, a, an incredible moment as God is speaking his word to Paul. What is Paul saying? He said, what a wretched man I am. Now for us, that gets us a little uncomfortable. Come on, Paul. Come on. Think positively about yourself. Come on. You, you, you got you to gotta pick your head up, man. You, you got to realize and you're good enough. You're better than most. See, that's our problem. Oftentimes what we think is, is that we have this comparative view of our holiness. We have comparative view of our goodness, right? And so we look around and we begin to say, okay, compared to all the other people around me, where do I line up in this? 
And when we begin to think through, do I actually need a Savior? We begin to kind of put ourselves in the continuum of the people around us and say, well, I'm pretty good. But here's one of my roles in your life. is to be able to clarify some stuff and help you to understand that one day all of us are going to stand before a incredibly holy, perfect, heavenly Father. And on that day, the scripture says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. That there will be a moment where you realize that your holiness, your righteousness, Paul says, is as filthy rags. That, that everything that you've tried to measure up in your life said, hey, this is my good stuff. That in comparison to a perfect, holy God, you don't measure up. I don't measure up. There's none of us that come even close to the holiness that God presents. So, so for us, one of the things that I want for you to understand is that, is that this is something you need to know in life and not just in death. For you not to have a surprise when you die and say, oh my goodness, I didn't realize. I thought this was a, a scale based upon the general holiness of the world around me and I just had to be on the 51st percentile of this to get into heaven. I just had to be better than those people who are locked up and incarcerated. I had to figure out just how to be pretty good. But this is something that's radically different. And so when Paul begins to see, he says, what a wretched man that I am. And this is where I want us. For some of us, we don't pursue holiness. We don't have remarkable lives because we don't realize that what we produce in our lives is far from what God intends. That God wants us to be people that are so much more like him than we can imagine. And that idea of being so much more like him is that sense of being able to live a satisfied, holy, joyful, remarkable life. And so on one side, we live in this reality that we are someone who desperately needs to be saved. And on the other side, we understand that, 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 that Jesus has done it all. And so we live in this, in this I'm a wretch but I was loved enough that Jesus sent his son to me. And that tension is what creates worship. That you begin to understand, this is what I deserve. This is what I've been given. This is what I deserve. This is what I've been given. And so that tension allows us to be white hot worshipers of our heavenly father because we begin to realize that this is not of us. That we couldn't white knuckle our way. We couldn't, do, we couldn't be good enough because that standard of holiness would freak us out. We begin to realize there is a moment we're going to hit our knees. We're going to say, yes, you are Lord. There's no doubt about it. On my best day that I ever lived on earth, I could not come compare to your holiness, your goodness, your love. But for us to be able to say, but I, I'm in Christ. The, the, the death that I deserved, that I was given, and now I stand before a holy Father, a, a God who is, who is perfect and just, and he looks at me, and when he sees me, he sees the perfection of his Son, and that is overwhelming. And for that to, to just completely mess us up and completely transform our lives and for us to fully believe in this. And when we begin to say, if, if I'm a wretch, what do I need to do? What is it that I need to, to figure out? And so we see all this. I do what I do, don't want to do, but what I want to do, I don't end up doing. And this is, the, this is the frustration of my life, this cycle over and over and over. What a wretched man I am. So, so what should I do? Who will rescue me? What will rescue me? We begin to see this. We say, what will rescue me? We begin to say, what do I need to do? Tell me, Keith. And this is why they had 600 laws to figure out how they could live up to the standard, the holiness of their heavenly father. They begin to recognize, man, this, this God is an incredible God. Okay, so tell me all the things that I need to do. What will rescue me? What do I need to read, Keith? What do I need to understand? What laws? Can you give me three points? What is it that I need to do to be able to figure out how to live to the expectations of our heavenly father? This is what it looks like, but this is not what Paul says. Here's what Paul says. He says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Now, that is a massive thing. 
that we think in our religious minds, our works-based minds, that we just need to figure out what we need to be able to do to overcome this sin, to overcome this stuff that separates us from God. And maybe we're not thinking about that standing that moment in God, but we are thinking about the consequences of sin in our life. So what do I need to do? What book do I need to read? Where do I need to go? I, I need to find a preacher who will help me to understand those practicals and understand and be inspired to be able to live this thing out. And so we look for inspiration. We try to figure out what it is that, 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 that kind of gives us enough, enough energy to be able to, to make sure that we're choosing good choices. And all the while, here's what Paul says. It's not what, it's who. See, it's the who connects to the do. So I, here's what I do. Here's what I don't do. Here's all this. The who is what connects to the do. I, want to, I know that's super cheesy, right? But I want that to land in our hearts, right? Um, so I want us to say that one, two, three, the who connects to the do. One, two, three, the who connects to the do. I want you to begin to think through when you begin to have this process of this is who I should be and the ought to and the should and the temptation in this. I don't want you to think what. I want you to think who. Because what will have a temporary victor, victory or a temporary setback, but that temporary victory because you made this you know, great decision or, or that thing, you failed in this decision, but it doesn't lead you into something that creates patterns of victory in your life, patterns of transformation in your life. Only the who creates the patterns of victory in your life. And here's what he says. He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so then, I myself, in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law, but my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. I want you to see what's happening here. He's saying, I'm a wretch, but, but who will save me? Here, here's the, the huge question. Who will rescue me? Who will make me into the person that is transformed, is remarkable? And he says, this is, thanks be to Jesus. Uh, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then he talks about this, this tension. Then I find myself in my mind, I'm a slave to God's law, but my sinful nature is slave to the law of sin. And here's what we begin to press into. That in every moment of your life, the who is the question. The what is the question. And where will you identify in this moment? That you have a choice to identify with the sin of the flesh and living in Adam, or you have the uh, you have a, a opportunity to identify with the spirit of Christ in you. So in each moment, here, here's the tension. Are you going to identify with Adam? Or are you going to identify with Christ? Because in this, sin is still trying to say, hey, this is what is demanded of you. This is what is expected of you. You got to do this. This is Mr. Sin trying to end your life. But you are in Christ. And so there's this tension. Sin living in you, but you are already someone who's transformed into the image of Christ. So we have a choice of which one we identify with. So we come up into this place. We come into this decision. We come into these circumstances, and you choose. Where do you identify? And here's what it looks like. When we begin to identify it with Adam, we kind of come into this place and says, well, you know, no one's perfect. Man, that standard is so high. Well, man, no one else is living to this standard. Why, why should I deny this desire that I might live into this kind of standard? Look around. This is not really the expectation, right? Man, this is what, you know, I've, I've had this, this, this thing has kind of gone through my life over and over. I, I've failed in this so many times, right? My mom did this. My dad did this. My friends do this. We start identifying with the flesh. We start identifying with sin. Sin speaking to us. And we're identifying with it. On the other hand, for you to be able to say, this is not who I'm meant to be. That sin says that this is going to satisfy me, but I know it's not. That God's called me to live in a different way. And then I know that real peace and satisfaction and joy, that's going to be found as I make this decision to be in the spirit, not in the flesh. And so I'm not, I'm going to, I'm not going to shut my mouth in that. I'm not going to, I, I'm not going to take 
this, and uh, I'm not going to use my mouth for, for, for the flesh. I'm going to use my mouth for the spirit. I'm not going to use my hands for the flesh. I'm going to use my hands for the spirit. I'm not, I'm not saying, sin, you, you can't have my feet. I'm, I'm not going to go there. I, I, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere else. Sin, you can't have this. I, I'm going to have... I'm going to have the Spirit alive and well in my life. And we begin to have a moment in everything. Where do we identify with? And sometimes it's just a moment, right? But for us, we need to begin to understand that this is the reality. That you're saying no, not to you in this, but you're saying no to sin. And this is a mind-blowing thing because oftentimes we just think this is who we are. But this is sin in you. And you began to say, no, sin, you can't have my hands. No, sin, you can't have my mind. No, sin, you can't have my mouth. And we are saying no to this. And you do not have power over this. That I can say no, that you don't have control over the members of my body, right? And, and here's what we need to say. And you need to understand that sin is not your master. Master, that sin is not your. In fact, I want us to say that out loud because I, I need this to kind of be an audible experience for us. One, two, three. Sin is not my master. I want you to say it with a little bit more energy. One, two, three. Sin is not my master. Yeah. I want us to go the other direction. I want us to whisper this. One, two, three. Sin is not my master. And now I want you to say this just like barely audible. Ready? Sin. And here's what we need to understand. That in these moments where we have the choice to identify with our flesh or identify with spirit, we are going to have to maybe a hundred times a day say, sin, you're not my master. And for us to understand what's at stake and for us to understand what is going on and what we begin to see is bit by bit, things begin to be transformed in us. And we begin to understand that no longer is sin our master. This is, this is the old us. But this is what happens when we are in Christ. That we have a new family, a new identity, and this is now our new reality. And we begin to live into that new reality and saying, sin, you can't have this. Sin, I know that you're trying to help me to believe that this is, I'm stuck in this, but that's, you're powerless. A couple of weeks ago, Josh gave just a brilliant illustration about what it looks like for international adoption as he and Amy as they're preparing to, to adopt a, a kid and they've done all the paperwork. At, at some point, soon we hope that the signatures will be complete on that. All the paperwork will be done. And then there's a child that will be transferred from, from an orphanage into their family, right? And, and what he's connecting with this with and, and what he's helping us understand is, is this normative thing that there's this all this, all this legality stuff happened, but, but in the life of this child, it, there's this process that takes a little bit longer than just documents being signed. And, and, and he talked about this, this tendency sometimes for, for children that come and, and they have a new family, right? A new, a new standing, but they're hoarding stuff. And they, they have stuff that they've stored away because they don't believe that they're going to be provided for. That, 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 that same reality, even though it's changed, is not really changed in their life. And so they have security issues and, and they get scared and they're not sure about all these things. And, and they're trying to figure out, okay, I still have to do this on my own. I still have to figure out how to keep myself um, fed. I still have to make sure that I'm looking over my shoulder to make sure that nothing bad happens to me. And this goes on and on. And what has happened is that they have a new family, but they do not yet have a new identity. That they have been placed into a new family, but yet in their life, even though that's already happened, and that is forevermore. And they can, you can show them the pantry and say, there's plenty of food. And we're going to be around. And you have way more opportunities than you would have ever had. You have a family. This is new. This is real. This is something that is sealed legally that you're not going to be able to get out of. This is, this is something that you don't have to worry about. And yet they still hoard the Cheerios. This is you and I. This is us. That, that Christ has bought us into a new family. And yet we're hoarding Cheerios. And we're, we're people that don't understand this new identity that sin is no longer our master, but Christ is now our Savior, given his life for us and given his life to us so that we might live remarkable, transformed lives that draw us into his holiness, that draw us. And how does he draw it? It's by his grace. It's by his grace. And here's what it says. Chapter 8, it says this. 
Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Jesus, through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. This is a who. If it's a what, it's religion. But this is a who. If it's a self-help thing, it's a what. If it's a you got to do this thing, it's a what. But you've been given a who. That there's no more condemnation. That we don't have to approach God based upon merit. We don't have to approach God saying, I need to earn this from you. I need to measure up for this to be, so that I get your good graces. So I get all of these blessings. So I get all of this from you. So in this, we see all of this through Christ, in Christ stuff. And sometimes it just kind of, it's inspirational, but it doesn't affect who we are. But we have to understand that if we think that we can achieve a level of holiness that will do something more for us in the presence of God, we think absolutely wrong about that. That, that if we think, if I just do this, that he'll be more pleased with this. If I just get to this level, he'll do more for me. If I just kind of live into this level of morality, that he'll be more pleased with me. We are living in a works-based, joyless religion. And I want us to experience the soul-gripping grace that has been offered to us, that captures us, that changes our desires. So he says this, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened in the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he did, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that a righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. You are in Christ. You will fail, but you will experience grace and you'll be drawn to Christ and your desires will change. And this is the beauty of what this looks like. That it looks way more like falling in love than it does trying to be good enough. That your heart is captured. And here's what it looks like for us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Too many of us were living by the flesh. We've put a veneer of Christianity over it, but we're still living in the flesh, defeated, struggling lives. But God said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to understand that I've given you grace, that there's nothing that you can do to earn more of my pleasure, that there's nothing that you can do. Like if if you mess up all day long, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to give you good things. It doesn't mean that you you have to reach this level of thing and and then I'll be able to give you this stuff. And so you're trying your best to get to God. God says, you can be an absolute wretch and you have all of me. You have all of me and I'm gonna give you good things. This is that grace that when we begin to realize I'm a wretch and I've been given everything that absolutely captures our hearts. It's the story that makes us love deeply, a white heart, a white hot affection for our God. Not because we did all the stuff, not because we figured out a better way to live, but because God said, I know you couldn't be capable of living this in your life. I know that you screw up, but I love you. I've sent my son. You are in Christ. I want you to realize you're in Christ. You have a new family. Live into that family. This is the grace that's been offered to you that you might be able to identify yourself with this family. And here's how we begin to live remarkable lives. When we begin to realize that this is is what Jesus says, right? I'm the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me or abide in me, you will bear much fruit. You'll live a remarkable life, transformed life. You'll be able to overcome that cyclical sin. You'll be able to stop struggling. If you're abiding in Christ, you're living life, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. But apart from me, where's what this looks like? You can do nothing. And we, somehow we forget that verse and we're living our lives and we're just saying, I'll take, I, I'll just kind of view myself as trying to do hard in this thing and trying to do good enough, but, but not let the grace of God draw my heart to God so my desires change towards the rest of my life. And so I continually struggle with this anger issue. I continue to struggle with this lust issue, but my heart's not being changed. 
This is what I want to call us to. You will bear much fruit. In the very end of Galatians 5, 25, it says this, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. He's talking about all this fruit that comes out of our life. He's talking about all the things. When, when God shows up in your life, it, it, it creates this fruit, all these incredible things. But then he says, here's how this fruit is, is created. It's by you keeping in step with the Spirit, about abiding in Christ, making it about a who and not a what. Making it about something that looks a lot more like falling in love than by white-knuckling your way to being good enough for a Savior. Keep in step with the Spirit. So let me give you four ideas to kind of land this and help us to understand what this looks like. One, I want to ask you to accept this new identity. You've been adopted. You're, You're in Christ. Would you begin to believe that's who you are and that become this reality in your life that you stop living this defeated Mr. Sin uh, filled life? That you begin to believe, I don't have to live that way. I'm not powerless over this. I'm in Christ. And for us to stop being in Christ but have hearts that are full of shame and condemnation. And so we're not living like Christ, but we're in Christ. We're living on the other side of the chalk line because we're afraid of the blood or just the paint. Number two, embrace the reality that sin is not your master. Embrace the reality that sin is not your master. Say that. Identify sin. Make this an entity. Personify sin. Number three, here's what I want. I want you to think I got out of step. Versus I did it again. I think I got out of step. I'm in the grace of God and I got out of step with the Spirit. Versus I did it again. And number four, I want you to seize the moment. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. It says you're not going to get a temptation that you can't bear. So in every moment in your life, you have an opportunity to figure out what are you going to live into. Are you going to live in Adam or are you going to live in Christ? And in that moment, you get to say, am I going to get into the flesh? Am I going to get in this where I'm just saying, I'm just going to this is I'm just going to get in, in the flesh. I'm going to, uh, nobody's perfect. I have this desire. I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go with it. Or are you going to say, I want to walk by the spirit. And forevermore, I want you to have that lens forever to, to, to be able to see this and be able to say, I have a good choice every single day. And here's what I hope. Here's what I know will happen and I hope happens to you, is that as you walk in step with the Spirit, what will happen is that you will see yourself not trying harder to change, that you will see yourself transforming in a way that you didn't even expect, that you'll look more like the fruit of the Spirit. All of this stuff will be manifested in your life, but it's because you've been pressing into Jesus, not pressing into the greater discipline in your life. There's been some moments in my life where I've fallen in love. All right, the first one was with, was with, my, with my wife. And there's this kind of process where, where I had this cognitive understanding of being in love. I know this doesn't make any sense. Like, but in my head, it makes sense. I had this cognitive understanding of being in, in love, but not this emotive sense. And then one day it happened. One day, I, just, I don't know how it happened. I didn't try to make it happen, but one day I fell in love. We'd already been dating for a while, but I fell in love. And, and all of a sudden, my, my heart, I understood country songs. I mean, this is like, this is like, oh my goodness, this is, this is what makes so much sense. I couldn't get this. But then all of a sudden, it worked. My heart was captured. And when I had my children, there was my heart, was, I, I love. And a moment where I looked across a sea of people and I said, I, I, I want to make sure that they understand Jesus. And my heart was filled with compassion and love. And this is what I believe the Christian life looks like, is for us understanding the who and having our, our hearts drawn into the desire to chase after God. And that desire happens when bit by bit we say, I want to be in Christ. I'm going to be in Christ. And our Bit by bit, our desires change. And we begin to say, this is the easiest thing in the world to live like Christ. 
because it's what I want to do. That's freedom. Freedom is doing what you already want to do. I want you to live a free life. And so, Resonate, may we be people who live this free life, who understand that we don't deserve anything but hell, but we have been given the grace. And may we walk in a grace that gives us a change of desires that allows us to live a remarkable life. Won't you bow your head and let's pray together.